everyone, and welcome to episode two of Stack, Sip, and Spill. I'm Cherie. And I'm Reagan. And today we are going to talk about the history of Italian greyhounds. So, Reagan, what are you sipping on tonight? I'm sipping on a crisp apple, apple soda. And I'm also drinking apple juice. That was not coordinated. No, but... I know, we didn't coordinate that. Maybe the chilly cold weather just makes us crave some apples. That's kind of also the only thing that I have to sip on right now. Unless I want something hot and I don't, so... We're going to talk about some Italian Greyhound history today. This was actually my husband's request and what he wanted to hear about. I wrote a preface for this. We are not geneticists, archaeologists, or historians. We are merely gathering all this information that we knew and the generally accepted knowledge about IGs and presenting it to you in this lovely podcast form. Yay! Let's start out in ancient Egypt. Picture the majestic landscapes of ancient Egypt, the pyramids, the Nile River, and a civilization that thrived for centuries. But amidst this landscape, there were these sleek, elegant dogs that would later become known as Italian greyhounds. Contrary to its name, the Italian greyhound's ancestry has deep roots in the land of pharaohs, more Egyptian than Italian. Let's embark on a journey through time where the Italian Greyhound story intertwines with an ancient breed known as Tessum. The Tessum, depicted on the bas reliefs of ancient Egypt, serves as a living testament to the Italian Greyhound's ancient lineage. Remarkably, the Tessum is not only a predecessor to the Italian Greyhound, but also to other distinguished breeds like the Basenji and Cerneco dell'Etna. Even in the distant Sumerian past, a symbol resembling an Italian greyhound graced their scripts. This early representation highlights the lasting impact of these elegant hounds across ancient cultures. Travel back 5,000 years before our era, where archaeological excavations in Egypt reveal the presence of a dog morphologically similar to the Italian greyhound. Intriguingly, a small greyhound mummy was found, accompanied by papyrus sheet chronicling its name, age, and breed characteristics. A petite dog skeleton resembling the Italian greyhound was also unearthed near Queen Hernaeth's tomb dating back to 2950 BCE. These ancient Egyptian greyhounds held a special place in society, evolving from companions and hunting partners to revered idols. Births were celebrated with grandeur, rivaling only the birth of a son. The mourning for a departed greyhound mirrored the sorrow of losing a family member. Picture the majestic walls of Egyptian tombs adorned with images of greyhounds. Among the revered pharaohs laid to rest with their greyhounds are Tutankhamun, Amenhotep II, Tutmos III, Queen Hatshepsut, and even Cleopatra. The bond between these rulers and their greyhounds transcended life and death, with beloved hounds mummified and laid to rest alongside their noble owners. As we unravel the historical tapestry of Italian greyhounds, our journey takes us to the illustrious realms of ancient Greece and Rome, where these graceful hounds etch their paw prints in the annals of time. In Greece, the Italian greyhound's ancestor, the greyhound, made a dramatic entrance. The Greeks, captivated by their elegance, likely acquired them from the Egyptian merchants before 1000 BC. Iconic tales of Grecian gods and heroes resonate with the presence of greyhounds. In Homer's Odyssey, penned in 800 BC, the hero of Odysseus, returning after two decades, is recognized only by his hound Argus, a sidehound embodying grace and loyalty. Arts and coins from Greece reveal depictions of short hair hounds strikingly akin to modern greyhounds. It's a testament to the breed's enduring form virtually unchanged since 500 BC. 
Fast forward to 325 BC, where the majestic greyhound named Peritus accompanies Alexander the Great on his military campaigns. A loyal companion raised from a pup, Peritus sacrificed his life to save Alexander, earning a city named in his honor. In the Greek pantheon, gods such as Hecate and Pollux were often depicted with greyhound companions, showcasing the revered status these hounds held in Grecian mythology. As we cross into ancient Rome, the Romans obtained their greyhounds from Greeks and Celts, referring to them as Celt hounds. Deities like Diana and the Roman Artemis hunted alongside these hounds, patronizing animals and embodying the essence of Roman coursing traditions. In Roman art, scenes of hunting and hounds abound. A popular tale involves Diana gifting a greyhound named Lelaps to her friend Procris, leading to a mythical chase that turns both hound and hare into stone. The Romans embraced greyhounds for coursing, as described by Flavius Arianus in 124 AD. Coursing wasn't about catching hares, but relishing the chase itself, a testament to the joyous spirit of the sport. Amidst all this, the Italian greyhound lineage takes root. Traces found in Mediterranean docks and iconographic studies suggest a breed that has remained remarkably unchanged for over 2,000 years, evolving from the Laconian Greyhound of Greece. A delightful tidbit from ancient Pompeii, a tile mosaic from a 2nd century BCE house with the words cave canem, beware of dog, a term we all know well today. But here's the twist. It wasn't about scaring intruders. Instead, it cautioned invited guests to tread lightly, avoiding the tiny Italian greyhound-like dog that called the place home. In the Middle Ages, greyhounds faced near extinction during the times of famine. It was the intervention of clergymen who safeguarded and bred them, eventually making them the cherished companions of nobility. A significant turning point occurred in the 10th century as King Hal of Wales enacted a law that deemed killing a greyhound punishable by death. Further, King Canute of England in 1014 laid down the forest laws reserving vast hunting areas exclusively for nobility. The strict forest laws introduced by William the Conqueror in 1066 reinforced the aristocratic connection with greyhounds. Commoners caught hunting with greyhounds faced severe punishments. A saying emerged among the English aristocracy. You could tell a gentleman by his horses and his greyhounds. Old paintings and tapestries from hunting feasts often featured these elegant hounds. Greyhounds took on symbolic roles often featured as emblems in tombs symbolizing knightly virtues, hunting occupations, and the aristocratic way of life. Notably, they were associated with knighthood rather than with the ladies. Geoffrey Chaucer's 14th century The Canterbury Tales immortalized greyhounds as the first breed mentioned in English literature. The monk in the tale spared no expense on his greyhounds, underlining their esteemed status. As symbols in tombs and esteemed figures in literature, greyhounds took center stage in the Renaissance. Artists like Veronese and Uccello depicted them in various settings, emphasizing their grace and elegance. The 16th century brought coursing races into play, with Queen Elizabeth I contributing rules that shaped the future of the sport. Greyhounds became synonymous with nobility and grace. King James I's passion for greyhound coursing added a royal touch to the tradition. His involvement in Fordham marked the beginning of competitive racing in Newmarket, further showcasing the allure of Italian greyhounds. By the late 16th century, greyhounds with their slender proportions were described as the most noble and princely, strong, nimble, swift, and valiant by Gervas Markham, solidifying their place among aristocratic circles. Transitioning into the Renaissance, European royalty saw Italian greyhounds. Figures like Catherine the Great, Queen Victoria, and Mary Queen of Scots cherished these lapdogs for their small size, elegance, and regal appearance. Italian greyhounds found favor among Italian nobility, 
immortalized and paintings and sculptures in its distinct and recognizable form. The breed earned its title, the Italian Greyhound, reflecting its widespread popularity in Italy during this artistic and cultural period. The Italian Greyhound's influence extended beyond Italy, reaching various parts of Europe, including England by the 17th century. Frederick the Great of Prussia was a king that had many IGs as pets. One, which he was particularly fond of, he carried with him wherever he went. During a period in the Seven Years' War, the tide of the battle turned so quickly that Frederick found himself in a precarious position behind enemy lines. Dogs in arms, he took refuge under an arch in the, under a bridge. The pair survived. When the dog died, however, Frederic buried him with his own hands in the grounds of the palace in Berlin. He later built a beautiful tomb to the little dog's memory. A phrase attributed to Frederic is, the more I see men, the better I like my dog. In the 1800s during the Victorian era, a trend emerged in England that fueled the passion for small toy dogs. This era marked a fashionable pursuit of breeding even smaller dogs, and the Italian Greyhound was not immune to this fascination. Despite their innate hunting abilities demonstrated in their native country, the English predominantly embraced the Italian Greyhound as a cherished companion pet. The breed's role shifted from hunting to a more domestic and affectionate role in the hearts of English enthusiasts during the Victorian era. In the late 19th century, efforts were made to shrink the Italian Greyhound even further, causing a strain in the gene pool. This miniaturization trend continued, leading to challenges in maintaining the breed's integrity. Fortunately, the Italian Greyhound Club, founded in 1900 in the United Kingdom, stepped in to safeguard the breed. Dedicated to reviving these regal canines to their original form, they played a crucial role in preserving the essence of Italian Greyhounds. Amidst the turmoil of World War I and II, Italian Greyhounds faced a precarious existence in England. In a stroke of fortune, Italian Greyhounds found sanctuary in the New World, America. Introduced in the late 1800s, breeding populations from the United States and Canada became the saviors of the European population post-World War II. From historical nobility to contemporary charm, these dogs have found their way into the hearts of celebrities and social media royalty. Take Jenna Marbles, for instance. Her YouTube fame extended to her Italian Greyhounds, Kermit and Peach, turning them into virtual stars with their playful escapades. And over in the world of late night TV, Seth Meyers is another fan of these elegant companions, showcasing the joys of having Italian Greyhounds with his Iggy Frisbee. Transitioning to the digital realm, Tika the Iggy has become an Instagram sensation, charming thousands with her stunning visuals and delightful adventures. It's amazing how Italian greyhounds, once cherished by aristocracy, continue to captivate in the digital age. So kind of wrapping up our historical episode, I'm going to give some interesting dates that well, at least we think they're interesting and important to the Italian Greyhound community. Starting off at 1886, the first AKC registered Italian Greyhound was Lily with two L's. In 1892, Iravana is the oldest existing Italian Greyhound kennel that was established in the United States. In 1949, the first Italian Greyhound placed Toy Group 1, Iravana's Philip. So, a, an Italian Greyhound from that oldest existing IG kennel. In 1951, the IGCA, Italian Greyhound Club of America, was founded. And the first IG specialty, so a show completely with Italian Greyhounds only, was held in Rye, New York in 1954 by the IGCA. And then in 1957, the first Italian Greyhound to earn a champion and a CD title, which is Companion Dog, was Portia's West Felicas Marcus. 
1959, the first copy of the Italian Greyhound magazine was published in June. Unfortunately, it's not currently being published. If you're able to get your hands on some of those copies, you can find them on eBay most of the time. Or if you come out to a nationals, we always have some in the silent auction. Sheree and I both have started to grow our collection and see if we can complete the um, years. It's a fun thing to look back and, and see how the breed has changed even just in the past few decades. And also tracing your own dog's ancestry back is really fun to be able to look in those magazines. And then this last date that I have is a pretty big one. In 1963, the first Italian Greyhound went best in show, and that was champion Flamina of Alpine. Lots of her pictures are in those Italian Greyhound magazines and back in pedigrees if you go look. So those are our few little interesting tidbits and important dates that we found. We have something a little bit lighter for you now. Now that you've learned about the history of the Italian Greyhound, we're going to start a, a continuing segment, things to know before you get an IG. And a lot of this is also just, you know, before you get a dog. As we think of things, we'll revisit and add to this episode because it, it could go on forever, really. <laughs> Let's get you started. What, what is one of the things you want to mention? This has come up recently. Number one... Do your research. Make sure an IG is the right for your family and your lifestyle. Because they're not for everyone. No dog, IG or not, deserves to be a spur of the moment decision. Dogs take planning. Planning on your end. Planning on that breeder's end if you do choose to go to a breeder. If you're going to do adoption. It takes a lot of planning and preparation. I'm going to piggyback off of what Reagan said. Doing your research applies to so much, but the first thing that came to my mind was take time off. Plan to take some time off and be home with your dog. IG or otherwise puppy or adult, whatever. I've only ever gotten a dog when I had, like, I was off a of spring break or over a, a Thanksgiving break or something. It gives you, first of all, time for them to bond with you because you need a strong bond, especially with a sighthound, where you need to really work on recall because they're they're very fast. It gives you a chance, puppy or adult, to work on your house training, whether it's starting from scratch or them learning your routine. And particularly in young Italian greyhounds, making sure they're not jumping off of anything. We all know that leg breaks are an issue with Italian greyhounds, mainly in, in your puppies when they're that growth plate is still growing and it's not solid yet. You got to watch them. You got to keep them entertained and keep their little wandering eyes away from things that they can jump onto and off of. They think they're superheroes, so they will jump. They will run. They'll do parkour, okay? <laughs> Puppy parkour. Parkour. Yes. Puppy parkour. Believe me, it's happened to me. So, yes, I'm aware. We're just going down a list of people and going, ooh, yeah, yeah this yeah, one, yeah, yeah, this one. Invest in a dog crate. You're probably going to end up having multiple throughout their lifetime. And also, depending on if the dog's going to get bigger, wire crate, soft crate, have a few different options if you want. But get a good wire crate for starters. Make it their own little safe place. They'll learn to love it. I know a lot of people, it can be controversial. Why would I put my dog in a cage? Well, I don't even call it a cage. You call it a kennel or a crate, if that makes you feel better. But it's for their safety and for your peace of mind as well, too. Because if you're at work, you know exactly where your dog's at. And you don't have to worry. Oh, my dog might be running down the road. Well, if it's in this crate and it's locked in there, yeah, no. And also for just overall fire safety, if something were to happen and some emergency services have to come in your house, you know exactly where your dog's at. Like my dog's in a crate right now. You can go in and even maybe pick the crate up and bring whole, the whole crate outside with the dog in it. Or you're able to quickly get the dog out and outside. Traveling as well. If you uh, have your crate, 
put it in the car if you're going to go travel somewhere. So if something does happen, um, they're safely in their crate and hopefully it will protect them. X-pins. This is kind of a personal thing that I've started doing, especially traveling a lot with showing I have an X pin that I carry with me and I also have some of the soft puppy play pins and I will line the X pin with pee pads and with like chip clips or little little clippies. So then if we're kind of in a strange area or if it's late at night and I'm traveling by myself, I don't exactly want to go outside in the dark if I don't have to. So I do have a potty area set up. So definitely recommend getting an X-Pen. And X-Pen is one of those, it looks like a wire crate, except it doesn't have a top and you can kind of control how big you want that area to be. It's like a playpen area. It's short for exercise pin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we get used to saying X-Pen all the time. I actually have one out of PVC. Daniel recommended that to me. It's babies gate stuff you know it's an x-pen made entirely out of pvc and it's pretty tall and it's lightweight nice that's a good one too they're very helpful to have and we can get more into this in a later episode but i use it a lot also not only for traveling but in my garage when it's really cold outside and if you know anything about italian greyhounds which will tell you right away they don't like the cold they don't like the rain they don't like ice they don't like snow anything cold and wet they're probably not going to like it so in the winter time i do set up a little pea potty area out in the garage and i line it just like i would when i'm traveling that way i don't have to force him to go outside in the cold and he'll go out there and do his business and come in and it's also safer too at night I don't have to worry about animals being in the backyard that sort of thing i live kind of out in the middle of some pasture. So we have coyotes, skunks, raccoons, all kinds of stuff. So it's helped me out quite a bit. I would also recommend if you're nervous about the wire kennel, just go with the plastic one first too. That's actually, I, it's, it's just a matter of preference really. But I always get the plastic one first because that's what we use for travel anyways. And I've noticed more and more on the internet, there's more awareness about how much more safe that is in a vehicle to have the plastic kennel. Ben, for example, he liked the plastic one better than the wire in the first place. And mama was concerned about his little jaw getting stuck in the wire. And I was like, well, then just put him in the plastic one and he'll just go in there on his own. You'd be surprised how fast you could crate train them when you just put their treats and their bones in there and make it warm and cozy. And they're gonna be like, oh, a little spot that's just for me. I can go there and no one's going to bother me and just leave it open all the time. Yeah. Just let him hang out in there. I'll put his dog puzzle in there and he's not going to be able to pick up the whole puzzle, you know, so that's where you go to have fun. And so that's what he stays in when mama goes out because he's still small. So he's still got plenty of room in there and he's not going to potty in there because it's small. And then you can work up to the wire or vice versa. And there are also other options too if you want to really put down some money there are some impact crates that's on my to-do list eventually i'm gonna get a good impact crate <laughs> but not right now i also don't have a car that would fit one right now so and something else you have to think about if you are going to be traveling a lot with your dogs depending on what crate you have you might want to pay attention to how your airflow is in your car in my car, I don't have vents in the back to adjust, so I have to make sure my vents are pointed straight to the back for Barry or have a fan. And that's part of the reason why I'm still using a wire crate in my car, because I don't feel like he would get enough air circulation in a plastic. So, Luckily, they're not a very furry breed, so it's not so bad. Yeah. So my next thing on the list, I'm all about a GPS collar. I didn't microchip Lucky till he was a year i wanted him to grow out a little bit more so as he was showing the microchip wouldn't travel and end up somewhere else other than his shoulders and look like a weird little piece of rice sticking out of his it just wouldn't matter it's not going to hurt your dog it just might look kind of funny if it if it migrates i got him the tractive oh hello thank you for my kiss <laughs> it's great i live in a suburb if he got out, he could be gone so fast and I would not know where to go, where to get him. thing I like about, not sponsored, but hey, Tractive, if you want to sponsor us. It's small. He never even noticed it on his collar. It has never bothered him. He never tried to get to it. It's got the GPS. 
but also it's um, like Bluetooth. So if we're out in the middle of the woods and there's nobody else there, you wouldn't be able to use a, an air tag because it has to ping off of someone else's iPhone. But this, you can just straight up just use the GPS. It also has a little Bluetooth thing where we did this during a walk one day. As you get closer to it, the, the bubble on your screen gets larger. So in real time, you can tell if you're getting closer to your dog. So I thought that was pretty cool. So I, I highly recommend a GPS collar. I know <laughs> Gia Iggy would probably also recommend that too. Yeah, they're important. Big cities or small cities. These are sight hounds. They can jump much higher than you think. And trust me, they can go faster than you. Yes. Even our senior ones, if they want to, they will be faster than you. The amount of people I've had come up to me in a store and be like, oh, I bet he can run really fast. <laughs> yeah, he can outrun all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The puppies can outrun you. Yeah, yeah. Lucky, can he ended up getting a microchip, though, which was the next thing on my list. Um, microchip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your pets, yeah. And they're not, it's not a big deal. Yeah, we just waited a little longer, but he had the GPS on all the time. I ended up, I think I got Barry's microchip when he was already going under for something because he, he tried to be Superman once and guess what happened? And while he was under for that repairing, I went ahead and did his microchip then. So there are ways to do it. Sometimes the needles can be kind of big. Sometimes they're normal size. My vet had a really big one. So I was like, go ahead and put him under for that. But definitely a microchip if you can, as soon as you can, whenever you think it's the best time. Um, there are often drive through clinics for that too. So if you don't want to go make an appointment with your vet, you may have a drive through clinic near you. Um, there are some pet shops that also do microchip clinics. So also, Especially if you're thinking of getting a puppy, think about pet insurance. I wish I would have thought about that or knew that was an actual thing when I got Barry. Because now he's older and I'm not sure it would do me much good to get it now. But definitely as a puppy, look into that pet insurance. From now on, all of my dogs are going to have pet insurance. And because you're going to get your wonderful new IG from a reputable, responsible AKC reader, you get 30 days of AKC pet insurance with that. Yes. I compared all of them. So a little bit of reference. My first IG, just a just a pet dog. Didn't know how to find good breeder or anything. I didn't have pet insurance or anything. End of her life. She had kidney disease and uh, a good chunk of change went into her last couple years. So I compared a lot of health insurance for dogs before I got lucky. And I went with AKC one. The thing I particularly liked about the AKC one, it covers a lot of hereditary things and anything to do with breeding also, which for him, being a him, not so big of a deal. Uh, another thing I liked about theirs is it did cover, for example, if he's doing fast cat and breaks a leg, God forbid, it would still cover that the first time. Now, if he does that same thing again, it wouldn't. But most of those don't cover accidents at all if they were doing some kind of coursing or racing or something. And I would like him to maybe one day get a chance to try fast cat. Oh, I know Ben's going to love it one day. <laughs> oh. Ben's going to like barn hunt, too everything he's going to like everything. yes he's gonna be so much fun <laughs> yeah oh my gosh i can only imagine him be like hey and, and, and rats and i get to climb on it and do tunnels yes a handful next on our list is make sure your vet is sight town experienced because sight hounds are kind of particular with their anesthesia and different treatments so just making sure your vet knows about that and their temperament because I or IG specifically, they're a lot different than some of the other side hounds. I mean, they're pretty aloof, shy to strangers. I mean, we said they were superheroes, so they would straight up jump out of a, one of those little crates that they have in their offices. So um, it's happened. They can be misleading. Yeah. Misleading, I think is a good word. They're like, yep, yeah, everything's good. 
goodbye. Yeah, I've heard. <laughs> like, I thought they were. Cool. I, I don't remember who it was, but someone told me a story about. Um, actually, I think it might have been my old vet. He had. I knew he had side down experience, but he did say one of the IGs that he had treated for a leg break had just recovered, was in for like a follow up visit, and in one of the crates, and it was one of the upper level. And the vet tech went to go get the IG out and the IG went straight over her shoulder onto the ground, broke again. So from then on, they started creating IGs on the bottom. Jeez. So it, it happens. Yeah. I'm always worried yeah. about it with Barry. So my vet takes them to the back to draw blood, which kind of makes me feel better because I don't I don't like seeing that. I don't like Barry's been in, the, in and out of the vet so often. And I feel like he acts better with them to but it makes me nervous still. <laughs> I would even add on to not just uh, not just one who knows sight hounds, but is very comfortable with toy, toy dogs. Not that IGs are that small, but their veins are small. The needles and everything are a lot smaller on them just because they got those little skinny legs and little skinny veins and things. Yes. If for whatever reason you do do have to have some sort of leg surgery. Maybe even go ahead and check and see before you get your IG that what kind of surgery your vet offers as far as do they pin, do they plate, that sort of thing. And if they don't, see if you can go ahead and find a vet around you, if you can, just to have that prepared for if anything were to happen. There's a really good vet in West Virginia that um, if you're in any of the Italian Greyhound Facebook groups, they'll, everyone's going to tell you that is the go-to um, vet to go see for any leg breaks. Um, it's Dr. Gary Brown in West Virginia. A lot of people fly their dogs up there and or travel in the car, and your IG will stay up there with him for most of the recovery time just to make sure that everything's good and ready to go and he has igs of his own so he knows he's specialized with igs so make sure that your vet knows um stuff about the breed their particular needs and try to go ahead and and is willing to research yes yeah mm -hmm. who's open to research if you're like please i'd really like to look different. now my story about having to choose a vet because Dr. Stacy retired. We still love her. Our vet, Dr. Stacy, was so great and very diligent and always researching any any new information that we needed. So when it came time for us to be introduced to a new vet, there were a couple vets at her clinic. And I talked to Dr. Megan, and she is a new vet. So that's also something you can go with if you find a new, young, freshly graduated vet. They're going to know the newest techniques and they're going to have the newest information. Ah. Oh, okay. Uh, the, so the next thing I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with the Martingale. I'm going to steal that because a lot of people don't even know what that is. Uh, or they think it's something to do with horses because that's a, that's in the horse world. A martingale collar, M-A-R-T-I-N-G-A-L-E, sometimes also called a greyhound collar or a hound collar. It functions a little differently than just your standard collar. It it has the collar itself, but that is attached to a ring of fabric, and that ring of fabric can t tighten up a little bit. A little bit. I mean a little bit. Not a lot. This is not like a like a pinch collar or whatever you call it. Um, because the sight hound neck is thick, and it tapers to that smaller point at their skull, a regular collar is just going to slip off. When they back out and they squirm, because these are like squirmy little wild chickens, when they want to leave, they're going to leave. It will slip right off their neck. But that martingale, that extra little bit of loop, snugs up just enough that it won't go past the base of their skull. Uh, my breeder, Nautica Wildheart, Daniel Stutzman, even though they know I have these things, they still send home a martingale collar <laughs> with every puppy. And don't get a martingale that has a, a snap 
right? Because that completely defeats the purpose. That thing can pop open. People say, I think it's advertised as like a safety buckle, a safety release. No, it's not. You don't need that on a Greyhound, on an Italian Greyhound, because there's already some extra room built into that Martingale. That's how it functions. You can find them in all kinds of cool things. Um, you can get them on Amazon. That's honestly where I get theirs. Just a plain webbing martingale. You can find super cute ones. You can find them that have clips and pinches and all kinds of cool stuff. So definitely get one of those before you ever even pick up your dog. Per keep it a little bit too small for a couple days. Don't take it off of them. Just leave it on them. Just leave it on them. It's nice and snug. They're just going to live with it, and you don't have to worry about not being able to catch them again to put it back on. To kind of branch off of martingales, um, something to think about is having a secure area to walk your dog. Um, a securely fenced-in yard, or be prepared to walk them on a reliable leash and martingale collar. Um, a lot of the IG rescues now have gotten more particular about uh, making sure these potential ad adopters have a fenced-in yard or have a plan in place for what they would be doing to let their pa pets go outside, um, which should be self-explanatory, but but, you know, um, so make sure you have a plan for that. Um, if you don't have a yard, if you live in an apartment or something, make sure that you have a reliable leash and a good collar. Maybe go ahead and get one of those GPS collars and make sure you have a microchip um, placed just in case. Um, this is definitely a breed you have to uh, prepare ahead of time for things to go wrong. Um, just to be safe. They're they're clever. Yes. They're sneaky little things. Yes. I would also say, uh, so we have the typical suburban, what is it, maybe three foot, three and a half, whatever, whatever's the normal height of a chain leak fence. They can jump them. If they want to jump them, they will. They you will see them sometimes, <laughs> sometimes he does it to me, jump up and pogo and will end up eye to eye. You know, they can get as high as they want to. Um, if it's a small enough gap that they can get their head through it, they could probably get through it. Because they're skinny little fellows. Personally, I don't even let my dogs out in the backyard just out. I have a long leash. One of those like 30 foot ones, you know. I loop it to a beam <laughs> on our back porch and they think they're free. So then I know they're not going to jump anything. I know they're not going to get anything they shouldn't, and they don't go running through the giant puddles. But they have like a huge distance that they can play with. Yeah, Barry, and I don't, I don't have to worry Barry about. Barry doesn't get very far from me, so he, if I don't go out with him, he goes out and he doesn't. He barely gets off the back porch, goes to the bathroom, comes right back in. So, <laughs> but I'm in a suburb yeah. with dogs yeah, on not, two sides of me yeah, too. Yeah, I'm. I have. So. It's a little... There's cows behind my dangerous. house, so... <laughs> I could see Barry be like, I'm going to go make friends Hey, he is man. a farm dog, so he's farm dog certified. I could totally see that. That's so funny. <laughs> it's winter. It's winter. If you get an Italian Greyhound, your dog is going to end up wearing clothes. If you are one of those people who thinks it's silly, it's not the breed for you. <laughs> no. Dog is gonna end up in clothes, and I'm here to let you know you're gonna like it. And then you're gonna be stuck with it, and you're gonna think it's adorable, and you're gonna learn how to make them, and you're gonna find the whole world of Italian Greyhound fashion that's out there. Yeah, and you're gonna have to just go ahead and clean out part of your closet um, to go ahead and prepare for their wardrobe to be um, placed in there because you're gonna end up buying a lot or making a lot. They're gonna have outfits for. Every occasion, every holiday, birthdays, everything. And you can't just get it at Target. No. Because it does not fit a nope. night hound. 
you're going to end up having to get them on the internet. Your typical sweaters, your typical dog sweaters, that will be okay. They'll Their little booties might be hanging out a bit. But there's tons of places on Etsy and on the internet. The Pampered Iggy, she makes a lot of great stuff. Wolf to Hounds, that's Prince Pablo Iggy. Hermes Secret, Hermes and Hera. They may not live in them all the time. Some Italian Greyhounds really are very shivery, especially as they get older. Dolce pretty much lived in clothes as she got older. They don't have a ton of fur. So if you're going to have them out in the summer too, you might want to look into the UPF. I have a couple for Lucky because he's red. So he, again, doesn't have a lot of sun protection. So that way we don't have to worry about it at the beach. UPF 50. Um, If you're in a colder climate and you are going to be walking them outside, of course, like any dog, you're going to need to protect their paws. You can get dog booties. Honey the Iggy. They make them. I want to say she's got a pattern out there of how to make your own your own dog snow boots. And most of your Italian Greyhound stuff is going to have a longer neck, like a turtleneck, like a snood, because those veins are exposed, you know, and they can get cold pretty quick if their necks are out. I guess I should have also added, you're going to buy a lot of blankets. All those super soft blankets you see at Kohl's and all those stores, oh, they're for sale. You are going to have a massive amount of blankets. <laughs> and you're going to have a crazy amount of dog beds that they don't lay in, too. Because I want to be with you, and you're not going to be sitting in a dog bed. So, <laughs> I'm just stating facts. I have one, two, three, four. Lucky just has one dog bed. Yeah, hold on. Let me count really quick. One, two, three, four. I just pile up blankets and call it the bed. Six. I have six dog beds in my house, and three of them are the size of a border collie. Because really, we just pile up blankets, and I say bed, and he goes to whatever pile of blankets there is. Yeah. They don't care. Barry doesn't. (laughs) I need one of those giant dog beds that humans can lay in, too. Um, I would do that. I could totally see that. Mm Mm-hmm. So, my next thing I just came up with, so you actually have no idea what I'm about to say. Oh, boy. Um, So. I like it. If you get a boy. Oh, boy. Be prepared to wipe their legs and wipe their chest when they go pee, if they're lazy peers. Um, And don't let people tell you that it is stupid. (laughs) To get a wipe warmer because it makes life a whole lot easier. Um, I have a wipe warmer down. Yeah, they don't like gold yeah, wipes. My um, breeder, Patty, always used to um, laugh and playfully make fun of me. <laughs> Anytime we would meet someone, she would say, Reagan, tell them, tell them how you um, bring Barry inside from going out to potty. Um, tell them what you have by the back door. Um, I have a wipe warmer next to my back door <laughs> and a trash can with a lid. Um, you know, the kind you step on the bottom and it opens up so you don't have to smell those pee wipes. Um, because Barry is a lazy peer most of the time, unless there's something out there that smells really good, um, to pee on and he hikes really nicely. Most of the time he's lazy and he gets it all over his big barrel chest and front legs. So he gets wiped every time he comes in regardless. Um, so be prepared to, uh, start buying those baby wipes. I know you're jealous of my situation with Lucky because he's still a leaner. Yeah, Barry's not. But he does end up getting on his front feet sometimes. He ends up getting on his front feet sometimes. And not just, not just sighthounds. I mean, boys, you know, it can happen. Uh, And girls, if they walk, if you, if you have them pad trained and they get a little pee pee on their feet, you do have to clean it off. Because you can get all kind of foot issues, and that's when you start with the foot licking, and you get the little foot fungus, so you got to keep them clean. But yeah, baby wipes for the chest, and the business, and the front legs, for sure. Which means you have to do more dog clothes. Right? Sometimes. Um, Oh, we forgot a big (laughs) one that kind of goes along with that. If you get boy dogs, and girl dogs too, um, belly bands. You are going to need to get belly bands. Um, if you've never heard of those before, it's basically a little diaper that you wrap around their belly, um, normally sticks with Velcro. You can, um, 
sometimes they have Washable. have like a film or, or something to catch the pee or the drivel on the inside but some of them you do have to buy like sanitary pads to put on the inside um and change them out if they happen to go mark somewhere or have an accident um i got the washable ones off of amazon me too Boom. um easy and it's just i have some for extra protection especially if we go stay in a hotel or something um just in case he gets a wild hair and is like, hey, I'm going to go pee on the edge of this bed. Um, and then girls, you can get little panties for them um, because a lot of people don't know this, but girls will mark too. I know an IG girl that marks. Yeah. I've been around them and they'll back right up, let them go. And yeah, so maybe think about going ahead and getting some little panties just to keep on hand. Yeah, we have the belly bands. Never actually even had to use them because <laughs> he leans and he doesn't mark. But um, <laughs> wait, wait. you're going to say thing. that and then in Alexandria, Barry's going to bring it out of him. Oh, Barry brings a lot of things out. <laughs> oh, uh, But I mean, every once in a while we put one on him just to remind him this is a thing that can Are happen. Are you saying my son is a bad influence? <laughs> Now we're gonna get <gasps> me and my son are never talking to now you. Now we're again. gonna get comments. Oh my gosh, she's one of those people that calls her dog her son. I'm not saying that Barry taught <laughs> a bad influence to Lucky, which Lucky then did to Ben, but it, he didn't know about it before Barry did it. Unless that's what he did while you were at work. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Barry only does it around Lucky, so. You said he humps everything. Okay, maybe. You said he humps all the dogs. <laughs> maybe. Oh, my goodness. Anyway. That's going to be Alexandria. <laughs> we're going to, hey, all right, we are well, having we... a party, so you never know what's going to happen. Oh, it's a party, all right. Um, So we are going to add more onto this in the future as we think of more things. Uh, Probably as soon as we... Stop recording. We're going to go, oh, shoot. I should have mentioned such and such. But we're going to continue to add on to this. And if there's anything you think of that we didn't mention, that you're yelling at us, why didn't you say this first? Then, yeah, uh, send us a DM at Stack Sips. Anytime anything comes up, even yes. if it doesn't have to do with our episode, maybe we haven't talked about something before. Or if there's something that you want us to maybe research or talk about. Go ahead and send a message to our account and um, we'll probably yeah, yeah. respond right away. <laughs> so to wrap up the episode, what are we currently working on, Cherie? What are we currently working on? Well, I went last week, so you go this time. Okay. You go first. So really, we're not working exactly on anything actually one of our main goals this year was just completed um yeah. barry yeah barry now has his vcmx which is a title that we can get from the igca if you have enough um, points racked up to get that title his um, versatility certificate master excellent is what he got and that is the highest level to those versatility certificates been working on that for a while and just got confirmation that he got it so that's fun he is officially excellent yeah <laughs> we're just kind of working on touching up on our showing and looking forward to next weekend what are we doing next weekend Cherie? next weekend alexandria louisiana yeah i'm so excited so uh, what we're working on, um, more training for Ben. Ben's doing pretty good. Well, he's doing very good on the table. And <clears throat> anytime someone pretends to play judge, he does really well. Thursday night is the only handling class we're going to get to go to before we leave next week. So hoping that goes well. <laughs> my mom and my husband are also going to come to the handling class. <laughs> See how that goes. See if they are can pick up any tips because oh, the worst possible situation has happened <laughs> at a dog show. 
my two dogs have conflicting ring times. Yes, that happens uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> the joys so, of having more than one dog to show. Ben has his beginner puppy pretty much at the same time that Lucky will be going in the ring. I looked at it and I compared the amount of dogs and I think it's going to be simultaneous. So someone else might have to be going in with Lucky. Lucky can pretty much show himself. Mm-hmm. That's he knows what to a, do before I even tell him to do it. He's a champion now. That's why. He's a champion. So um, I guess for Lucky, it's going to be reminding him that he can do this without me. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we need to work on Thursday night. And not be like, Mom! My mom! You might just have to leave the room while Brent works with Lucky. <laughs> well, you'll hear more about that if that works or not. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then I've been refreshing Lucky's take, where he, like, takes a toy out of my hand and holds it, because he's got a little toy picnic basket. Mm-hmm. So we're working on take again so that I can then put stuff in it and, it, you know, take the groceries and walk away with it for Trick Dog. And brushing up his crawl again for longer distances. He loves crawl so much, because he really army crawls. It's hilarious. Oh, and Ben standing stacked on the ground for longer periods of time. Yeah. But that'll, that'll be a long-term thing. That won't happen by a beginner puppy. That's okay. Yeah, he's just a little puppy. He's he's doing pretty darn good, I think, for five months. But we have so much planned, especially for Alexandria. I look forward to seeing you all again and showing with y'all. Seeing and- my bestie. And having a little Marty party because it's going to be someone's birthday that weekend. Lucky second birthday. If you are on Instagram, we're going to you j- send us a tag us in a photo wearing purple, gold, and green. And his hashtag is going to be hashtag time to the number Marty, M A R D I, party, P A R T Y, time to to marty party yeah marty crawl party and i'm bringing a special surprise that i haven't told reagan about to make our live quote unquote live episode that much better wait live episode what are you talking about sheree we're gonna do a live i mean it might be short but we're gonna do it (laughs) anyways (laughs) it might be like hello instagram we okay. could do um we could do <laughs> what's in your show bag. <laughs> Unpack your show bag. Oh no. That might be embarrassing for the boys. Or just be just be a lot of uh quit humping him. Yeah. Get off of him. <laughs> Leave it. <laughs> yeah, we can have some nuggies at this party. <laughs> we can have some nuggies at this party. We can have nuggies and pizza. What what about tacos again? Last time we had tacos. That was a siesta fiesta. What what do they have in the Marty party? Crawfish, but we're not doing that. <laughs> he would roll all over it. <laughs> Ugh, bleh, uh, I don't do crawfish really. <laughs> okay, so do we have some shout outs this week? Yeah, for sharing some stories and supporting us. We have Prince Pablo Iggy. Kitty the Iggy, Ducky Iggy, and Iggy Gypsy, and Little Darling Poppy. We can I'll put their handles down in the show notes so you can all go show them love and support. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Maybe learned a little bit. I know I did. Let us know what else you're interested in hearing in the future. And we'll see you in Alexandria. Yay. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Click. (laughs) Bye.